In order to provide appropriate first aid, it is essential to recognize a seizure episode. Let us understand how a typical seizure looks like. What everybody understands as a type of seizure or what is a concept in the uh, community, the two common types would be the tightening of the body, something like this child doing a tightening of the body and the other commonest type is jerking of the body when the limbs, are, hands and feet are jerking like this. So these are the two common subtypes of the seizure which people usually do not miss and all of them will come as a presenting symptom as a seizure. Then there are uncommon seizure symptoms that can be missed. Unless and until people are asked preemptively, these symptoms may not be recognized. It might be recognized very late in the phase of the disease and four to five months may have lapsed when the parents approach a neurologist. By then, these symptoms may have become very significant. Three common subtypes uh, for these kind of subtle seizures would be, one is a sudden lightning jerk of the body. Child will just, just jerk like this, which is called a myoclonic jerk. Uh, there is another seizure type called infantile spasm, where a child, whenever he wakes up from the sleep or whenever he is going into the sleep, so the two twilight states, when he's coming out of the sleep and when he's, when he's going to sleep, he'll suddenly jerk, all the body will be jerking like this. This is called an infantile spasm. And the third common seizure type will be a, a staring episode uh, without loss of posture, which will be very, very brief, something not lasting more than 20 to 30 seconds, and the multiple episodes will be there in the day. So that is called absence seizures. Let us be clear on why it is important to treat epilepsy. Repeated and prolonged seizures can damage the brain, so treating it can greatly reduce behavioral problems. This can lead to improved school performance, accompanied by a decrease in various other developmental disturbances. Let us understand the various tools used by physicians in assessing and managing epilepsy. The seizure is a clinical diagnosis. No test is going to give us any diagnosis. So what is most important for a doctor to diagnose it as a seizure or a not seizure is history given by an adult witness. History gives you 70 to 80 percent of your diagnosis. Examination and investigations is just to reconfirm that whatever you have thought is correct or not. So history is extremely important. Whatever, it could be anything, whether it's a fever-related seizure, if it's not fever-related seizure, whether it's sleep-related seizure, not sleep-related, whether there's a relation to food or not. And there are multiple things which we do ask because there are multiple types of seizures which will have a very specific characteristics. So history and describing the episode, whatever has happened or the, whatever the primary concern they come, uh, come to us with, all these things give us, gives us a clear diagnosis. And the investigations are just to confirm whatever we are thinking is correct or not. An electroencephalogram or EEG records brain waves and is used for the initial evaluation for children presenting epilepsy. There are multiple reasons an EEG is ordered, but not all situations require an EEG-based investigation. When we want to know what is the status of the brain in the unconscious child, whether he is having internal seizures uh, without anything coming out, that's called non-convulsive status. That's a, uh, one of the important reasons why we do EEG, uh, just to see what are the interictal changes. Uh, or what is happening in between the two episodes of seizures. Is there anything wrong getting in the brain? The third common reason to find out the focus of the epilepsy. When there are especially focal seizures or seizures happening on one side of the body, uh, whatever externally uh, symptoms are there, whether they are correlating internally uh, with the given, because each lead of the EEG will, uh, will be correlating the specific area of the brain. Uh, the fourth important reason why we do EEG is to classify the electrical syndromes. When the episode of seizure is happening, it is practically impossible to capture the EEG correlate each and every time, especially if the seizure happens once in a while. More often, an EEG is done in between seizure episode, which is more informative to the doctor. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, generates a picture of the brain that can be used to detect physical changes that cause symptoms of epilepsy. Some of these changes include an overall structural abnormality, specific brain areas in an EEG were found to emit more electrical signals than the rest of the brain. If the previous MRI is normal 
and we want to investigate the brain structure with a better resolution MRI. In these situations, an MRI investigation will prove to be helpful. Most of the times EEG and MRI for a pure epileptic patient is more than enough. But sometimes there are as other associated syndromes where the epilepsy would be part of the disease. So to identify those syndromes or the disease, we sometimes take help of other investigations like uh, lumbar puncture and doing a CSF analysis or a sometimes a SPECT scan, sometimes a metabolic screening and their metabolic screening includes a lot of other things as well. And sometimes uh, when the diagnosis is still in doubt, uh, we do order sometimes genetic testing as well. To summarize, in this video, we addressed some of the common and uncommon seizure symptoms. We were informed of some of the standard tools that are used for epilepsy diagnosis.